I watched four eras, 37 movies in a row, and 69 years nice. of Godzilla just so I could find out how the King of Monsters evolved from a symbol of atomic horror into a balancing force for planet Earth. So let's bow in and start breaking it down. Original Flavor Gojira is a straight up horror movie and don't let anyone fool you. The entire inception of the world's most famous monster, Yu Kong, came from the real life horrors of Atomic War. Specifically, being on the receiving end of Atomic War. And I need you to keep that in mind because it's such an important key detail that it would work as a weapon in Kingdom Hearts. Everything in the movie is dedicated to the literal fallout from the Atomic Age. From Godzilla's skin that is supposed to resemble those of real-life radiation victims, to the torturous decision of using the Oxygen Destroyer to take him out. If you've never seen the original Godzilla, it's worth watching at least once in your life. There's a reason that the King of Monsters has a star in Hollywood. After this point, Godzilla gets a little bit of a Pepsi twist and slowly becomes more and more heroic over the years. This actually brings about some interesting connotations. Because originally, he wasn't just a vessel for nuclear fallout. He was also one for America. I think you can see where I'm going with this, but hold on, let me cook. Gordon Camsey here, cooking up some kaiju. So basically, as Japan was recovering from the war and turning into an international superpower, so too was Godzilla. Now he wasn't so much a metaphor for Japan's pain, nor the ones who inflicted said pain, but instead, he was an icon for the strength and resilience of Japan itself. He may have been a victim, but him, damn it, he was gonna survive. The evolution coincidentally began in 1964 alongside the introduction of his greatest nemesis, King Ghidorah. This movie happened to fully transition Godzilla from dangerous monster into dangerous monster hero. Matter of fact, the entire Showa era eventually became known and defined by its campy heroics. You want Godzilla getting zapped in the nuts? Only in the 60s. You want a sliding dropkick? Go ahead and have some. It's my treat. Oh, you want to see Godzilla hit a dance number, huh? That fucking happened. That'd be like seeing the Xenomorph hit a TikTok dance. Oh wait, that exists too. Welcome to Showa era, the sequel. So all of that Godzilla silliness ended up putting the franchise on ice for a whole ass decade. Eventually, though, he reawakens in the 80s with a throwback to the first movie, only to pop another 180 and head right back into heroics. Although, plot twist, Japan now exists in the post akita world, and Big G decided to follow suit. He's more of a begrudging anti-hero this time around, as opposed to a straight-up good guy. This new Heisei era also follows a very strong continuity from piece to piece, but the unique symbolism now is derived from how Godzilla interacts with his new rogues gallery, as opposed to just being all on Big G himself. Almost all of Godzilla's enemies are now the result of some form of scientific tampering or manipulation. Whether that's aliens, genetics, time, or all three simultaneously. Point is that Godzilla is the focus for what all of these little plot threads are going to hang off of, and they use Big G as the example for how out of control science can get. You see what I see, right? Because to me, it feels like the Heisei era used Godzilla as a platform to discuss the paranoia and potential dangers of pushing new scientific fields forward. Especially the then-current progress they were making in the fields of space and genetics. As well as using the Atomic Era as a reason for why we should still remain cautious. Let's move on to the first time America got their hands on Godzilla. Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin, aka the Masters of Disaster, aka Team Red, took Godzilla, a near immortal creature, mind you, that also happens to represent the horrors of the atomic age and demanded equally horrific moral choices in order to stop. And, you know, turn him into an iguana that could be shot down by the US military. Nailed it, boys. They're virtually identical. 
It's not exactly a secret that the 98 version of Godzilla is basically a Full Moon Studios knockoff with the budget of a Marvel movie. And if we're being completely fair, it had about that much thought put in it too. However, every single one of those thoughts belonged to Team Red over there. And I don't know man, but I think it says something when they took a creature famous for its durability and resilience and just made him allergic to military bullets. It's also very important to point out that at the time, Godzilla was an icon for Japan as a whole to America. So I think it's a little messed up that Godzilla was so easily killed over here in America. So if you couldn't tell, I'm not exactly a big fan of this movie and I'd rather move on than give it any more attention. So let's talk about the Millennium Era. Now, the Millennium Era of Godzilla, besides being a slap to the 98 version, is just oops all monsters. Don't you worry, he makes sure to kick both cheeks on every kaiju's ass he runs across, but Big G over here is also handing Tokyo a swipe with every movie. Even the final movie of this era, which is the most outwardly heroic version of Millennium Godzilla, still has him pissed off at humanity by the time he goes back to the ocean. It's also important to point out that the Millennium Era of Godzilla is anthological, and all that means is that each new movie is its own continuity. Or to put another way for the younger viewers out there, each new movie is its own multiverse. So whether Big G is a force of nature being studied by the Japanese government, or he's an entity that possesses all of the lost souls from World War II, that's the sentence that happened. The Godzilla of this era is defined by his malevolence and association to Japan's past. He simultaneously represents both Nippon and Nippon's greatest abuser, and I'm not what you'd call refined, but I think that's a pretty cool interpretation. Sadly, the movie still didn't do that well, so they ended up putting Godzilla back on ice for another decade. All the way up until 2014, where America got another stab at the dragon for the first time in this many years. As I'm sure most of you already know, Godzilla showed up in a post-Marvel world. And of course, since America has time, money, and no creativity, WB looked at their other property, Big D over here, and said, yeah, I'll have some of that. Enter the MonsterVerse. So how did America choose to interpret Godzilla this time? Well, our flagship monster is now an ancient apex predator whose role in the world is as a balancing force for planet Earth and its ecosystem. He isn't necessarily associated with the Atomic Era, but in canon, that is what woke him up from his Permian nappy. Hold on, do you smell that? Oh, don't you worry, Gordon Camsey's just here cooking up some good old southern style recontextualization. Godzilla originally started out as a representation for horror, tragedy, and a little bit of America, right? But the second time we get a crack at King Kaiju, we reinterpret the Mon, the myth, the legend as a balancing force for the entire planet. I mean, come on, everybody. He doesn't mean to kill people and destroy things, but that's just a consequence, you know, for taking down the bad guys and making sure the planet stays in balance. Okay, seriously, real talk here. My grandfather was a World War II vet, and if you've ever had the same experience I have of talking to other United States veterans during the World War II era, this is no shit how they viewed their country during the war. And I have no idea what it is about directors born before 1985, but nothing gets their clue goo going like World War the sequel. And I feel that Godzilla is the embodiment of this idea in the MonsterVerse. I mean, yes, he did just murder these two animals that only wanted to bang, but damn it, he did that for our own good. When another one shows up with the other diverse cast of animals from around the world, he actually gets to live because he bowed to him as king. No, you see, the alien is the threat in that movie. Then you get this young titan who refuses to bow down, but they both agree Mecha are cringe, so the two make sure to stomp down the machine uprising before it even starts. Now they're cool, and they're both kings. You know, as long as Godzilla gets to stay on top and he doesn't have to look at Kong. It's fine, buddy, you can be king too, as long as I don't have to see it. And please, let me be clear, I'm not saying that any of this is intentional or planned or what they had in mind. I just think it's really funny that there's enough subtext to make these jokes. I'll tell you what's not funny though, and that's Shin Godzilla. Except for this. That shit's hilarious.
So the first homecoming in 12 years sees the King of Monsters working with the creator of Evangelion himself, Hideaki Anno. This time though, he frees Godzilla from the shackles of the Great War's atomic symbolism and instead ties him down to the horrific power of nature itself, as well as nuclear disaster that isn't motivated by war. But he's also taken a radioactive dump on the inefficiency of the impotent corporate bureaucratic government. And I know that being from Japan, Anno is obviously aiming at his homeland's government, but part of what makes Shin Godzilla have such mass appeal is that the general sentiment that we have too many old farts in power is kinda shared worldwide now. If you're not flexible enough to get in and out of your own pants comfortably, how are you going to be flexible enough to adapt to a hurricane or an earthquake? All I'm trying to say is that the body follows the mind, and eventually rigidity is going to petrify you wholesale. I can't stand the anime trilogy, so I'm just gonna make this section quick. These three films wear its theming on its badly rendered sleeves. Godzilla is a literal plant monster, and one day, all of the kaiju wake up and start kicking humanity's collective ass, eventually forcing them off-world thanks to being saved by aliens. Except, surprise! Turns out the aliens worship an evil god, and they're setting up Earth as a sacrifice. so humanity just has to learn to deal with Earth being in charge when they have to rely on Godzilla to save them all. It's a very green message, which is not a bad thing. Where Big G here not so subtly stands in for the will of the planet and subjugates mankind underfoot. My issue comes from how everything else is handled. Technology in these films is seen as almost universally evil, and alien cultures are equally malevolent in their nature. Also, you know, our god of Earth kicks their god of space's ass. The films entirely dismiss the idea of balancing technological progression, alien belief systems, and green cohabitation, as well as getting rid of all form of nuance in the discussion. And with that being said, we've reached the end of this video. As always guys, thank you so much for watching. And that, my friends, has been 69 years of Godzilla interpretations. I don't mean to gush, but I have absolutely adored the King of Monsters ever since I was a little kid, so I really hope you also got some enjoyment out of my little passion project. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Every second of your time is equal to a wealth of support, and I am so grateful you tuned in. If you want to show even more love for the channel, feel free to do so down below, but until next time, guys, I'm bowing out. See you all later.